Do you have clients that trigger you? You know that's about you, right? And parts that beat you up for it, while others take you out in session, so you feel stuck. You are not alone, or at least you don't have to be. Join the six-session bi-weekly online internal family systems consult group. Get clarity. Reclaim your self-leadership. Enjoy your work again. Serve your clients better. IFSCA.ca. Go to the Supervision tab for more info or to sign up. I'm working with these traumatized kids, and it seems like we should go to their pain and try to help it. And so I'm trying to get there as soon as possible and finding that my clients are having these horrible reactions after my sessions. Had a client get into a car accident and didn't see the car or have a 103 fever right after a session. And at some point I started putting two and two together and saying, you know, there's something I'm doing that's creating this. And initially I got scared. I almost backed away from the whole phenomena. But then I got curious. And I began asking clients that were having these reactions, what's going on? What am I doing wrong? And they taught me this map that I'm about to give to you, giving it to you not so you impose it on your clients, but so that you don't make the mistakes that I was making that were creating those reactions. So I'm a systems guy. I'm looking for distinctions. The big distinction that leaped out immediately, which is held up as the big distinction among these parts for these, all these years, is between parts that are very, very vulnerable and carry the burdens from the traumas. The very uh, common ones would be pain, shame, terror, loneliness, sense of worthlessness. Vulnerable parts that carry those kinds of burdens from the trauma. And then the parts that protect them or try to protect the client from them. So I'm going to start with the vulnerable ones. Anybody here never been humiliated in your life? Or how about the last couple of weeks? Anybody? Not been humiliated? Last night. Last night? Okay. <laughs> when that happened to you, what did you try to do with the emotions, sensations, memories, and beliefs from that experience? Just call it out. Shut, shut it down, bury them. Challenge inside or challenge the person? Challenge inside those beliefs. Yeah, challenge them. Distract yourself somehow. Numb. Get numb, right? Perseverate. Perseverate. Oh, what did I do? How bad am I? Yeah. So in general, we tend to try to lock all that away somehow in inner basements or caves or abysses, not realizing that we're not just locking away the memory, sensations, emotions, and beliefs, but we're actually locking up the parts of us that now carry that, who are our most precious parts. Before they got hurt, we loved those parts. They gave us all kinds of creativity, and spontaneity, and trust, and playfulness, and so on and so on. But now, because they got hurt, it's insult to injury. The injury was the actual trauma. The insult is now we abandon them. We put them in an inner jail and throw away the key. And now, not only do we feel much more vulnerable because the world can trigger them, but also we don't have access to their wonderful qualities anymore. So these we call the exiles. Vulnerable parts contain precious qualities, get hurt or terrified or whatever, they fit, whatever burden they accrue, and then get locked up inside. 
And once you've got a bunch of exiles, the rest of your parts have to jump into these protective roles because the world becomes a much more scary place. People have the power to trigger that in you now. And when an exile is triggered, it has the power to overwhelm you with its burdens and pull you back into those scenes when you were humiliated, make you relive it, and make you uh, want to die in many cases. Does all that sound right? Okay. So we also have all these protectors, some of whom are working constantly to control our relationships, to control our appearance, to control our performance, to control our bodies and how much they let us feel so that the exiles don't get triggered. So nothing similar to what happened initially happens again. They have that never again kind of philosophy. They're trying to manage our lives, inner life and outer life, so that these parts don't get hurt anymore and so you don't ever feel them again. So these we call the managers. It's one class of protector. Would be called the defenses in traditional psychodynamic therapy. The world has a way of breaking through those defenses, triggering an exile. When that happens, it's an emergency. You feel all the feelings again. The exile takes over in a big way because it's been locked up and now it's finally get some access to you. You can't get out of bed. You, ju you just get totally bereft. You can't stop crying. To keep that from happening, there's another set of parts whose job it is to immediately go into action to deal with that emergency. Either by dousing the flames of emotion that are coming from the exile's feelings with some substance or getting you higher than the flames until they burn themselves out, getting you out of your body, sort of uh, distracting you till it all burns itself out. They tend to be, in contrast to the managers, who are big into control, want to control everything, want to... Um, often keep you in your head, they're preemptive, they're trying to anticipate danger. They're the ones when you walked into the room, stand for anybody you shouldn't sit near. <laughs> <laughs> they're often the critics, the managers. They're criticizing you to try and get you to behave or look right, or, <coughs> or they're criticizing you to run down your confidence so you don't take any risks. They're the hypervigilant parts, they're the caretaking parts, all, they're all have in common the desire to preempt anything. They're often trying to please people. These firefighters, that's the second class of protector, they don't give a shit about people. <laughs> they're impulsive, damn the torpedoes. They don't care about the collateral damage to your body to your relationships. They just know they've got to get you out of that exiled feeling right now or you're going to die. For them, it's life and death. So that's the map. Firefighters, managers, and exiles. Could you, could you give me an example of firefighters? So uh, the question was, is there an example of firefighters? So I'm going to give you all a chance to call out your favorite firefighter activity. So just go ahead. What, when you get triggered, when your exiles get triggered, what's your first impulse? Just call it out. Shopping, Shopping the great American firefighter. I'm convinced that if we all healed, our economy would go down the drain. Chocolate is one of mine. Wine. There's a lot of whiners here. Yeah. Wine. Huh? Anger? Anger? Anger. What? Popcorn and, Popcorn and Netflix binging? 
Sleeping? I have a client, we get close to her exhaust, she goes to sleep in my office. Boom, she's out. I've got to shake her to wake her back up. Yeah. Sex? I think I start looking for condos. Looking for condos? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And as, as I was driving over here, there's an unbelievable amount of condos being built here. Isn't there? These, uh, these cranes are everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so you get the idea. These are examples. These are great examples. How about your clients, firefighters? Cutting. Cutting. Uh, Marijuana. Social. Internet. Crack. Crack. Suicide. Suicide, yes. Porn. Affairs, porn. Dissociation is totally a firefighter often. Keeping very busy. Keeping very busy is one of mine, absolutely. Workaholism. Workaholism. Okay. Exercise. Anger. Exercise. Exercise. Gaming. What is it? Gaming. Gaming, Gaming yes. Disordered eating. Disordered eating. Housecleaning. Right. <laughs> Wish that was, my wife wishes that was a woman. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. So, most of us have a kind of hierarchy of them. We've got our favorite, that doesn't work, we go to the next level, that doesn't work, the next level. The top of that hierarchy is one that somebody did mention, guesses about that? Suicide. Suicide, it's the great escape. It's the big safety net to many of your clients. And here we are as well-meaning therapists coming along and saying, I want you to sign this contract saying you're not going to kill yourself. And you wonder why your client goes crazy. Because you're just taking away their safety net. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Can you have one that uh, crosses over both? For example, you mentioned um, working really hard. Could that be a manager and could that also be a firefighter? Yes. Working really hard, for example, could be a manager and it could be a firefighter. So, so so how do you distinguish? It's the point in the sequence. So managers, again, are preemptive. They're really trying to keep the exiles from being triggered. Firefighters, after the fact, after an exile has taken over or is about to take over, that's when they go into action. So here's an example. Let's say you're working with a guy who's a binge drinker. So he feels slighted. He goes to a bar. He gets drunk. That's a firefighter. But let's say he finds that if he stays drunk most of the time, he doesn't feel slighted in the first place. So drinking has shifted from being a firefighter activity to being a manager activity, used by different parts. Yeah. What about it, sort of the, I'm never going to speak to him again, yeah. the, that kind of cut off? Yeah, that's the, a firefighter in okay. general. Yeah. 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 Just depends. In different clients, they would be different. So, if, question, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, she asked about trying to compare this to Terry Reel's work. Terry's a very close friend of mine, very great therapist. We've done workshops together. And he doesn't really, well, he does, but he doesn't talk about parts so much. Um, and uh, uh, he talks about, what are they again? Uh, well, I was trying to relate it to the relationship Yeah. So pursuer and distancer could be from a manager, depending on what the intention is. If it's pursuing to get somebody to take care of the exiles and it's constant, it's preemptive. If it's pursuing when an exile feels slighted and it's desperate, it's more of a firefighter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's the relationship between the self and the vulnerable parts, the exiles? So when you start working with a client, there isn't much relationship. The protectors have effectively cut the self off from the exiles. 
and they have the power to do that. And part of the goal is to get permission from the protectors to go to the exiles, self to go to the exiles and form a trusting relationship with those younger inner children. So why am I giving you this map? Because again, as I mentioned, the mistake I was making initially was trying to get to the exiles without permission from the protectors. <coughs> these protectors had spent 30 years containing these exiles. And here, after a couple sessions, I'm opening the door and letting them out. They're really pissed. And they will punish your client, or they'll punish your relationship. They won't come back or something. So we don't do that anymore. So when a client comes in, even if they want to work with an exile, I've got this intense pain in my gut, I'll say, well, we'll get to that. But first, I want to talk to the parts that don't want us anywhere near that. That don't want us anywhere near that. And I want to see what that's about. <clears throat> so we generally go to protectors first. And this is, again, this is kind of radical too. We go to protectors not intending to get them to change. Because they won't, usually, until what they protect is less vulnerable. We go to protectors to get to know them, to honor them for their service, like you might the military, and to find out about what they protect, and then negotiate permission to go to that. We get permission, we go to the exiles, we heal them, and I'll talk later maybe about that process, and we come back now to the protectors, and now they're very open to unburdening themselves and changing into their naturally valuable roles. Because they can now see they don't have to protect this vulnerable or keep it locked up anymore, and they don't have to do this anymore. So that's sort of the process. And uh, you know, the map is designed to help you not do dam the damage that I was doing before. Multiplicity of the mind. Freud said, yes, there are these unconscious forces, but they're primitive. They're not worth talking to. They're not worth getting to know. All you can do is interpret their manifestations. So people stop being curious. So the exile would contain the burdens of these repressed memories that Freud initially saw as real, and then he did the, what's it called? Retraction? Yeah, but there's a word. Then he said, no, it's not real, it's all fantasy. It's Oedipal fantasies. Yeah. Which also set the trauma field back years and years. Yeah. Yeah. with the external world, like walking down a dark street at night. Yeah. Um, threats happen. Yeah. And we have parts that need to protect us and manage us and give us direction. Yes. About, that wouldn't be a great place to go. Yes. This kind of day, etc., etc. So are the parts that guide us in that the same manager and protector that are dealing with the internal things? In the Good question. So... Uh, to summarize the question, there are parts that look for danger in the present and don't want us to go down certain neighborhoods and streets. And uh, are they the same as the ones that we're talking about here? If you've got a lot of trauma, they probably are the same, and they're going to exaggerate the danger. And they're going to be running you. They're going to be dominating you. You don't have a lot of trauma. They're just kind of assistants, you know, who are just giving you advice. 
and let, and trusting you to make the right decision because they trust yourself. So that's really the day, the difference. Uh, it's the same parts, but in very different roles. So there are three main goals to IFS with individuals. The first is what we were talking about as the liberation of these parts from their extreme roles into their naturally valuable states. The second goal is what I'm going to call the restoration of trust of the parts in self-leadership because they lost trust in yourself back when you couldn't protect them when you were a kid. And they're like parentified children. You know what I mean by parentified children? They're little kids who got forced to be like parents because the parents abdicated for some reason. A third is the reharmonizing of this inner system. So not only are they in better roles, but now they begin to get to know and collaborate with each other. In which case, as you do this, people feel more and more unitary, feel more and more integrated, even though the parts still exist. So in contrast to the DID field or lots of other fields that see the parts, the trauma field, often sees the parts as the product of the trauma. And this goes back to um, Pierre Genet. Pierre Genet was all about parts, but he pathologized them by saying trauma creates them. It splits the brain, it splits the mind into these things. They're shards of the vase. The goal is to put them back together into one, so they disappear. And that remains the goal for many trauma therapists. Our goal is totally different. It's the reharmonizing. So again, it feels sometimes like they're not there anymore, but it's just because they don't stand out, because they're not so extreme. But they don't disappear. They just are now operating in the way they're designed to operate. And they're all very, very valuable. <laughs> Structural dissociation does Pathologized parts, yes. So the, question? the question is, when does this emerge? So my position is we're born with some parts online. Uh, like infant researchers will talk about five or six discrete states that infants rotate in. So for me, those are the parts that are there in the beginning that you need to, to make it as an infant. <laughs> yeah. And then the others are dormant, but they're there, and they come out, it's almost like a time-release capsule. They come out when the time is right for their role. So those of you who have children might remember that night when you put to bed this compliant little two-year-old, and then the next morning, this kid is saying no to everything. Do you remember that? <laughs> it's like that little assertive part debuted overnight. And to add to that, uh, a lot of the healing, actual healing, is what we call unburdening. It's helping the parts release these extreme beliefs and emotions that are driving them. And when they do that, they immediately transform into their naturally valuable states. It's kind of, seems impossible, seems like magic. I didn't believe it n until I saw it over and over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so what are the parts' relationships to each other? So, speaking of <laughs> some firefighter activity here. Um, so, polarization is a big concept in IFS. So when one part gets extreme in one direction, typically another part will have to become extreme in the opposite direction. So if you've got a, a firefighter that makes you drink too much, you're going to have a critic, a manager, who forced into the critical position of trying to contain that drinking firefighter. And it'll get more extreme the more the firefighter does its job. 
So the analogy would be to, let's say you, you're working with a family and they've got a very vulnerable child and they, they polarize about how best to parent that child. The father feels like I've got to make him tough so that the world doesn't get to him. The tougher the father is on him, the more overindulgent or, or, or too soft the mother becomes and so on. Same as in this, it's all parallel. The inner system is exactly the same, the way it operates as not just families, but also corporations and countries. And I've been writing some about our country, the US, and the exiles in our country and why that's driving the primary firefighter who's in charge of our country, who, <laughs> whose firefighter activities are tweeting in the middle of the night and so on. So. What? Yeah. What if you have a conflict where the, cl the client, the self, wants therapy, wants to heal? Yeah. And there are other parts that are suffering and want to heal. But there is a part that says, I don't consent. I don't want to change. I don't want to heal. I don't want to do this. That's every client. Right. <laughs> so, so. What, uh, what if you have a client? who has parts that want to heal, who has self that wants to heal, but there's a part that says, I don't want to, we're not going to, I'm not going to let this happen. What, what do you do, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the part I'm going to start with. I'm going to have you go right to that part. And just to give you a, a hint of what's to come. What's your name? Natalie. That's amazing. <laughs> You're the one with the fireflies, yeah. Um, so I'd say focus on that part, Natalie. Find it in your body, around your body. People can do that. They can tell you exactly where it seems to be broadcasting from. How do you feel toward it? I would get you to be curious about it. Okay? Any other? And once you're curious about it, just say, ask the part what it wants you to know about why it doesn't want you to do this. Just a very open-ended question. And it'll tell you. Right, but if it says, I'm fine, I don't need this, Okay. I'm done. So it says, I'm fine, I don't need this, I'm done. So the follow-up question is, ask the part what it's afraid would happen if it let this happen. Mm -hmm. What's it afraid would happen? Nothing. I, my life is okay the way it is. Okay. All of this, I've been to therapy a bazillion times. Everybody here? It's never worked. <laughs> Can you guys hear in the back? I'm okay. No? I, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so I would say let the part know that we get that it's feeling like it's not necessary and we honor that and we and I would just do a lot of a appreciation of this part and how it's tried to help in different ways, form a, have you form a relationship with it and come back to some of those questions. And now it's willing to talk about what it's afraid would happen if you actually did it, and then we negotiate. So. Yeah, you'll see that. You'll see some of that in the videos. Yeah. Um, can parts be fused or blended? Can parts be fused or blended with self? Yeah. Yeah. So parts often are blended. That's our term, actually. When you come in, self's in there, but it's blended with lots of other parts. And in the process of getting them to separate, you're getting more and more access to self that's in there. So that's what we call unblending. And simply having somebody focus on a part and find it in their body creates a little unblending, because now they're noticing it rather than being it. So, yeah. Just a follow-up to that. Can parts be blended with each other as well? Not so much. It doesn't happen so often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to trigger your exiles. Yeah, awesome. I have lots of parts reacting to this. <laughs> um, um, so I know that you mentioned a part can present as a manager and a firefighter, and I'm just wondering if you could speak more about um, how would a suicidal part, how do you tease out a suicidal part presenting more as a manager versus a firefighter? Because I imagine the intervention for the firefighter might need to be more uh, significant 
than for a manager. Does that not so much. No. no. I guess I'm, I'm asking, when, when do you need to get really concerned about somebody um, yeah. wanting to kill themselves versus this is, yeah, okay. Yeah, Thank so you. I get it. Thank you for taking the mic. Uh, so there are managers in suicidal places, and then there are firefighters. We treat both of them pretty much the same, I would say. So the conversation with the suicidal part would go something like this. What are you afraid would happen if you didn't kill her? Two common answers to that question. What do you think they are? She'll fall apart. She'll suffer. She'll keep suffering. I can't stand it. I'm going to take her out. And she'll fall apart, or she'll do this terrible thing that's hurt people, or she's evil, she needs to die. Those are the common answers. If we could change her suffering, if we could heal her suffering in a different way, would you have to kill her? No, but I don't think you can do that. I wouldn't want to kill her if I thought you could do that. We can do that, I promise. Would you give us a chance to show that we can do that? Part doesn't want to die. It knows it's going down with the ship. It's only going to kill her because it thinks there's no other option. Derek, in his intro, said, I'm a hope merchant. I'm totally selling hope to hopeless systems, constantly. With words like guarantee, which you've been schooled to never say to your clients. In 2003, I had to have open heart surgery. And I was really scared. And I interviewed surgeons. And I didn't go with the guy who said, I think maybe if we work together, we might be able to do this. I went with the guy who said, I'm the best, you're going to be fine. <laughs> this is scarier to your clients than open heart surgery. The idea of going to these parts they've locked away all these years is terrifying. They need to know you know what you're doing and that you can actually pull this off, and there's some good reason to do it. What's the point of opening that door to all that stuff unless you can heal it, unless you can expel the burdens out of the system? Like with kids, uh, we use a lot of play therapy technique, which involves drawing and puppets and movement and dance and so on. With my clients, I'll use those things when I need to. Many clients don't seem to need it. But a lot of uh, our work is finding where the part manifests in the body, how is it affecting your body, um, does it want to move your body, let's just see whatever it wants, that kind of thing. So it's pretty body-centered. I, I hung around when I was developing this with the Hakomi community. How many of you know about Hakomi? Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful body-centered kind of therapy and uh, borrowed a lot of that stuff from them. If you're a beginner in IFS, are, do you bluff your confidence? Sort of, yes. You can borrow it from me. And there is something to the fake it till you make it kind of thing. Um, but if you can access self with your client, you will just have that confidence. So, yeah. And let me just uh, follow up on that. And a lot of our training is designed to help therapists get to know their parts and their <laughs> self and know when you're with a client, if you're in a part or you're in self. And if it's a part, get that to step back so you can feel in this very palpable way the self energy in your body. So I don't work with anybody until I've really got that in my body. And the work is so much more effective when you, the therapist, can be in this place. Yeah. Um, do you sometimes have to work with protectors for months before you get to an exile? And the answer is yes. And a lot just depends on the client's horrible background and level of trust in people in general and how much the protectors trust you. But a lot of that depends on how much self you're bringing to the client. So I can, in demos or in one-session consults, get to places 
that might take other therapists a long, long time because they, their protectors sense my presence and they sense the safety of it and the lack of judgment. All parts are welcome. And that really, really helps them drop their weapons quickly. And that's taken me 30 years to cultivate. So... So parts has been pathologized in our culture. So how do you get going? As I say, multiplicity has been pathologized so that there's a subgroup of clients who, when you bring up the idea of parts, will say some version of, what do you think, I'm Sybil? For those of you younger, that's a reference to uh, a movie that became famous about a client of multiple personality. And, even the movies have pathologized. There's a, a recent movie, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, what's it called? I can't remember. Split. Yeah, that one I'm fine with, but Split again, the, the client is a pathological killer. So, uh, so anyway, multiplicity has been pathologized. So there is some initial back push with a small percentage actually of clients. <coughs> And then there are some clients who just don't want to focus inside, and they might pick that issue as the way to keep you out. So with some clients, that's a challenge. But in general, uh, and I still work with clients that don't know anything about this, I will, what's your problem? They tell me their problem. I'll say, OK, and when you have this problem, what do you say to yourself? What do you feel inside? And they say, I don't like myself, and I feel worthless. And I, like you, learned in graduate school to do reflective listening and feedback what they're saying. But I'll add the phrase, so part of you does this, and another part of you does that. And so part of you says you're bad, or whatever it said, and another part of you feels this way. Is that right? And virtually no clients say, what are you talking about parts at that point? Because everybody uses this language, which is why I use it. It's the most user-friendly word. It didn't get me very far in academia. But, and it's not the best word because it sounds kind of mechanical, like a car part. But it's the word that everybody uses. So they'll say, yeah, that's right. But if I said one of your internal objects and another of your subpersonalities, then, then you do get that pushback. So usually, we're fine at that point. At some point, I'll say, you know, we've talked about five or six different parts of you that are operating around this problem. Would you like to change some of that? Yes, that's why I'm here. OK, uh, there is this model. Uh, I can say that I developed, but you can say that this guy developed. <laughs> that is really good at helping change that stuff. What? Um, are you interested? I guess so. I don't know what it, what's involved. Well, it's just a kind of inner focus where you have this kind of inner dialogue a little bit with the parts of you you just mentioned that you typically don't dialogue with, that you just try to get away from or whatever. And it, it turns out that it's a very effective way to change all this. Again, uh, no pressure, but you know I'm good at it. I have a lot of success. Again, I can say that. You can't yet, but, <laughs> um, but most clients say, OK, I'll try it. All right, which of those do you want to work with first? If, again, they pick an exile, I'll say, we'll get to that, but let's go to the parts that don't want us there first. If they pick a protector, we'll start with that. 
How do you start? Just focus on that thought, or that impulse, or that emotion, or whatever the manifestation of the part is. Focus on that. Find it in your body or around your body, which provides a kind of anchor, or a, you know, so they have a direct place they're interacting with. And then this one of the couple big ubiquitous questions, how do you feel toward that part of you? In answering that question, they're telling you about how much self is present by not only the content of the answer, but the tone of voice and the facial expression. So if they say, I don't like it, by definition, that's a part. Self would never say that. Okay, and I'll say, okay, I can understand why you don't like it. It's created havoc in your life. But in this process, we're just going to get to know it a little bit. We're not going to give it more power to take over. We're just going to get to know it, and we might be able to help it change that way. So see if the parts that don't like it would be willing to give us a little space in there. There are versions of that. Give us some space. See if they'll step back. See if they'll relax a little bit so we can just get to know it. Okay, they did. How do you feel toward it now? So we do that process, step back, until the answer sounds like so. Curious about it, want to get to know it. Even I'm neutral, and I'll follow up with, are you willing to get to know it, or you, do you have an open mind toward it? If, if that's confirmed, then we'll, we'll go ahead. Those of you who do a lot of mindfulness stuff, it's just getting them in a mindful place relative to a part they typically don't like or try to fight with. Okay. Okay. And so most clients will go that far and they'll feel fine. And the next step is okay, ask this part what it wants you to know. Very benign, open ended question. At that, part, at that point, again, a small part percentage of clients will say, what do you mean, ask the part? Mm -hmm. What, you want me to talk to myself? Mm -hmm. I say, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> uh, but if they need it, I'll step out and I'll explain it more and I'll normalize it and I'll say, you know, uh, I've got parts and I do this and we all have them and uh, here's this book on it if you want to know more about it, which is the intro book that I think is here. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll take my time, and, and some part, people, this is too weird. Okay, and I'll back off, and I'll do something else, and I'll find ways to connect with them, and then a couple, of three sessions down the road, I'll bring it up again. Oh yeah, there's this part, and there's that part. So the issue was they didn't trust me enough yet, mm -hmm. and they just said, this is too weird. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a lot of the beginning stuff. Um, and, but most, how many of you are using IFS in some form or another? Wouldn't you agree that most clients are, okay, let's do it, and they start to do it, right? Yeah. And again, it depends on how much self you're bringing and how comfortable you are with explaining it. Yeah. Do you ever run into a situation where um, a person can identify a part but can't connect to it? In other words, like, I don't know, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Do we ever run into a situation where a person can sense a part or see it even, but in answering the question, they can't talk to it, and all you get is, I don't know how I feel toward it. I don't know. So that's a part. It's a part that's saying, I don't know. So if it's not self, by definition, it's a part. So then I'll say, okay, let me talk to the part that says, I don't know all the time. And I might do what I call direct access. I'll talk, I'll be the self. I'll talk to the part directly. So you're the one who says, I don't know, is that right? What are you afraid would happen if you didn't say I know, if you didn't take her mind? What are you afraid would happen? And you'll get an answer most of the time. And then we'll negotiate with it. And often I can get it to step back and now the client does know what she feels. Yeah, so there are clients who have 
uh, developmental delays or, or learning disabilities. And uh, so, as I say, we use it with kids down to age three. And it's, it is more concrete, and it's simpler, and so on. And we use some play therapy technique. And it's pretty similar with DD clients. They can do it, but it is more concrete. Yeah? With pre-verbal parts, uh -huh. um, do you find that the self is able to get some kind of a sense of the part, even if the part has no words? Yes. So pre-verbal parts we work with all the time. Uh, uh, and Sometimes they have words, you'd be quite surprised. Sometimes they don't, but you just go with the sensations or the, the images that the part wants to show. And so we can totally work with them the same way. Yeah? Um, if, do you find that if people are on medication at some time, whether prescribed or not, does that affect the process? Is it just no effect? Yeah, in fact, there's a guy named Frank, Tom, Frank Anderson who does all-day workshops on IFS and Psychopharm and uh, is a you know, neuropsychiatrist and will prescribe to clients. And what he'll say is, first of all, he'll give a medication to a client and then ask them to interview their parts. Is this helping or is this getting in the way? Because some medications absolutely unblend parts. It makes it easier, access more self. The same medication in a different client might just clog everything up and make it hard to do any work. So he'll have the client say, now this is in the, getting in the way. Try a different medication or a different dose. Uh, he'll also do things like, before giving a client, especially trauma client, he works in trauma a lot, trauma client, like a, a sleeping medication, for example, he'll ask, are there parts that really don't want you to sleep? And he'll work with those, because they can totally override any medication. <coughs> and he'll negotiate with them and, and work and co collaborate with them until they're on board with it, and then the, then the medication works. So there's a lot to be said about that <laughs> interface between IFS and medication. Yeah? I'm just wondering about um, use of IFS in people with a pain. I'm interested in wondering, do you think it's a nice No, it's a little tougher. I, I've worked uh, not a lot with traumatic brain uh, syndrome. And it's just tougher to access self. It's really, uh, you need a certain amount of hardware, it turns out, to be able to have, download enough stuff to do some of the work. It's harder. I'll do a lot of work with the parts myself, but yeah. Are there other strategies? I work with clients that are highly dissociative. I work with clients that are highly dissociative and have very, many, many parts and can shift between them like really quickly and rapidly. And so sometimes it's hard to even get to a target part mm -hmm. to know who's going to slow down enough to actually let me ask those questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, do you have other strategies other than the question, how do you feel towards that part to stabilize self in yep. that situation? Yeah. So there are clients, and I've worked with a number of those clients, where it's boom, boom, boom. You know, it's one part after another. What I learned down the road was to ask the part, some, like if you get a few minutes with one part, did somebody send you out here? And they'll often go, <laughs> and there's a, like this little Mr. Big in the background, little puppet master, who's determined to keep the client from going certain places. And it's just throwing one part after another at you. As, yeah. And so until you get to that one, you just experience that over and over. Yeah. Um, do you have clients that don't have any of the protector part? They just come in and it feels like they're just... They're just pure agile. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have to bring... So yeah, so clients will come in overwhelmed by an exile. And again, often you don't have that much access to their self. So I will talk to it as if I were talking to a terrified little girl, like you know, if somebody's having a panic attack or something like that in my office. So I'll be very comforting, and you're really welcome here, and I'm really glad you're here. And it would help us 
if you'd be willing to pull some of your energy out of her so that she can be here helping you too, would you be willing to do that? So this brings up another key discovery I made many years ago about these inner worlds. Parts can control how much they overwhelm, how much they blend. They're totally in control of it. Even parts you would think would have no ability to control. And if you can convince them it's in their best interest to separate, they can do it. So most of the time when an exile totally takes over, it's really afraid if it gives any separation, you're going to lock it up again. So it's like a rebel group in a country that feels like they've got to throw a coup and totally take over. You know what I'm saying? So if I can convince it it's in its best interest to separate, then they'll separate. Which brings up a whole other topic in the trauma world, which is this whole obsession the trauma field has with grounding skills. <laughs> so you're going to get me on a rant here, but let's go back to the panic attack client. For most of you would say, okay, I want you to look in my eyes, I want you to feel your feet on the floor, take some deep breaths, am I right? Yeah. What's the message you're giving to that little girl who's so terrifying? It's not okay to be here. It's not okay to be here. Yeah. You need to leave. So I'm on a kind of crusade against grounding skills in that context. <laughs> so I would say, you're totally welcome here. I'm so glad you made it out. We're going to help you. And it would help if you separated a little bit. Boom, she's grounded. As soon as the part separates, self is there. What did she, what did she become separated if you, a, a bit, if you started talking to her directly, rather than yeah. just saying, yeah, yeah, could yeah. you? You're, you're just so calling her down. What do you feel? Yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. What, where did you come from? That's that right. kind of thing. That's right. All of that is very calming on the part, reassuring that it's not going to be locked up again, and it's safe to let self help it too. I'll do the same thing. A client, I'm working with a trauma client, suddenly they dissociate, they're, they're mute, they, they're just... How many of you have that experience? You know, what did you do? You tried to help them ground themselves. What does that tell the dissociating part? You've got to get out of here. You don't belong here. I say, let me talk to the part that just took you out. You would be amazed that while they can't talk, the part itself will talk to me like a little magpie all about why it took them out and what it's afraid would happen if it didn't and so on and so on. I'll negotiate with it. I'll say, I'm totally sorry. We went too fast to this emotion that you don't want her near. I'm going to be more careful about that. Would you separate? Boom, she's grounded in. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Do you sometimes feel like you're not good enough? Most people do and find a whole bunch of ways to try to manage it or distract from it. But what if these were all just parts of you? And what if the part that feels badly just wants you to hear it, so it can unload its story, and the others can relax? Say hello to your internal family, www.ifsca.ca.